My name is Renee Clark, and this lecture is over Chapter 4 from the Think Python eBook. It is a case study, and we will be using the Turtle module. The Turtle module is very useful because it helps you to create some graphics within Python. Just like when we worked with the math module functionality, we first had to import the math module. We will be doing the same thing with the turtle module. So I'm going to start working in just a basic Anaconda prompt Python window. And I'm going to import turtle. Now I'm going to put in a parameter that I'm calling Bob. And Bob is equal to turtle dot, and here we're using the dot not notation to pull up some of the functionality of the turtle module. And I'm following it with turtle, except turtle is capitalized after the dot notation. And my open and close parentheses. Now you see that it's um, automatically opened up the Python Turtle Graphics window on top of my other windows. And right now I have just in the very center a little arrow pointing one direction. This is in fact my turtle. I can, as we're seeing here in the book, print Bob, Bob my parameter, which is a turtle. And all that's going to tell me is that it's an object, a turtle object, and its location. So let's move on down. Keep in mind we have turtle with a little t and turtle with a big t. They're two different things. Little t is the module and the function is the capital T. So that creates the turtle object. Once we have our turtle created, we can call a method on it. And this is what will move it around. Let's start making our turtle do things. So we're going to start with a basic move. And we're going to do this by calling a method. In this case, we're going to call the method forward by calling, putting in a dot notation fd. So I type in my Python window, Bob dot fd. So on the parameter Bob, I'm calling fd. And then inside of my parentheses, my argument that I'm going to be passing is how many pixels do I want Bob to move? While this is going, watch down in this window to see where Bob goes. I'm going to put it as 100. Now watch what happens when I move Bob. Bob moved 100 pixels. How big that is on your screen depends on your screen and your settings on your screen. So while here on my screen, to me, that looks like about an inch, on your screen it may look totally different. But we just are going to know that it's a pixel. Now I'm going to make Bob turn because I can make Bob go forward, backward, or left turn to right turn. So let's say Bob do a left turn and these are in degrees. I'm going to say make a 90 degree left turn. And you can see Bob has turned which way he's pointing. Now I can again tell Bob to move forward 100 pixels goes forward. I could continue that and you can see here in section 4.2 it's saying that I can do some simple repetition by just repeating the same command over and over. Let's make it a cleaner better program. Let's use a method or something that will allow us to repeat without needing to retype commands. Here they give us the four statement. So using the for statement will make your code repeat. In this case, for i in range 4, we'll make whatever is the part of that for loop repeat four times. And this would be my output if I was putting in print hello. We're going to use that, this for loop, to draw a square. All right, here we are with our script window for Python. I'm again using spider. All right, so I have my for statement in. 
and we're ready to try running my scripted program. So I'm going to try run, and it brings open my Python window here. And you can see that I went forward, took a left turn, forward, left turn, forward, left turn, and now my turtle's back to where it started. Now, keep in mind the syntax for a for statement is similar to a function definition that you've learned about in previous chapters. It has a header that ends with a colon, and it has an indented body, and the body can contain any number of statements. It is also known as a loop because the flow of execution through, runs through the program and then loops back, loops back to the top and runs again. In this case, it's been told to run four times. Now your chapter has several exercises that it'll ask you to do. Those are listed here in section 4.3 but read about them and then move on to 4.4 and it will actually walk you through them. Make sure you understand what each of the exercises is having you do. Here, we're going to create a function called square. So we're going to do a function definition and then we're going to call that function and pass the turtle as a parameter. So we need to have the import turtle, the bob functionality, you know, the parameter for bob set up. And then we're going to change, and we're going to insert a function definition in here. We're going to define this as square, and we're going to use the parameter t. Now we're going to put the for loop inside of it, and we're going to need to indent our two bob forwards and left turns so that they're included as part of the for loop. So we here we have encapsulated the for inside of a function definition called square. That's going to be at the front of our program, as all function definitions should be, by, you know, to make sure that they're available to be used in the program. We put them at the front. And then I'm going to go down a blank line. I'm going to backspace over to the left margin, add another blank line, and I'm now going to actually call the function square, and I'm going to pass it my turtle bob. So I'm going to call square, passing it bob. Bob will replace the t in my function definition. Now, I'm also going to go ahead, because we already have a square down here, I'm going to modify the number of pixels from 100 to 150, so that when you see it run, it will be slightly larger. You don't have to do that on yours. There you go. Now you can see I have two squares in my graphics box. So you can see how this functionality works. And this is an encapsulation. Wrapping a piece of code up in a function is called encapsulation. It's very useful because it lets our code be more concise. We don't need to copy and paste. We can simply make easier to read and understand code, and we don't have to type as much. The next step in this process is generalization. This is where we can add some parameters. Before, in order to change the size of the square, I edited the actual uh, bob forward statement and changed it from 100 to 150. I could generalize my square definition so that it includes a parameter called length. So let's do that next. Let's edit square, and I'm going to add a new parameter that's going to be called, and instead of the number here in the forward, I'm going to use length. Apologies. 
Now when I call Bob, I need to give it a length. So I'm going to give it something a little bigger. I've already used 100, 150, so let's use 130. And I'm going to run that code. And there you can see I now have a third square. They all start and end in the same place. You can take it even further. You can move forward and you can say, okay, instead of always making squares, I'm going to change and I'm going to create a polygon. And I'm going to have another parameter to, to pass. So I could change my square to polygon. I could add a third parameter. Maybe I'll, and I need to then set up for n. And they give you the formula here. So I'm going to put angle is equal to 360 divided by n. And n is going to be the number of sides you want your polygon to have. And then I am going to put, instead of range of 4, I'm going to say range of n. And I'm going to change how many degrees I'm turning to angle. Now when I call Bob, I will pass three parameters. Uh, let's make a seven-sided polygon that turns at 70 degrees. Now before I can run my new function, I need to change square to polygon. I now get a polygon. I can still make a square. All I need to do is use four sides in 90 degree turns, and then I will get my square in here. I can also adjust my length. I could make it a bigger square. And you can continue to generalize your interface so that you can make it even better and easier to use. Some of the things that you can do is add what are known as keyword arguments. So here in my call and in my definition, I set it up to say, well, n is what I want to be 7 and length is what I want to be 70. This is easier to read, easier to understand if you pick up somebody else's work and they've written their call statements like this, they're much easier to follow and understand. As you continue through this chapter, it will walk you through how to make a circle. It gives you the formulas again. And it talks about refractoring. Work your way carefully through these so that you can see and understand what each of these steps do for you. And it makes for better programming long in the long run. It makes your programs easier to reuse and develop. Now all of this is part of a development plan, which is just the process you use for writing programs. Here they're using capsulation and generalization. So you're going to start small anytime you work in one of these with a small type of functionality, a small program, and then you build on it. And you can just keep encapsulating things together, adding parameters until you get to the final product. Because when you start, you don't always know exactly what it is you want your end product to look like. Doc strings start with three double quote marks. They will allow you to use multiple lines. So everything between the first set of double, three double quote marks and the last set is a comment. Some people call these multi-line comments. It's a good way to explain anytime you're building your own function to give some information. So when you go to use it again or you want to share it with somebody else, they'll be able to understand it. Now, when you're debugging and you're calling functions, you can have preconditions and post conditions. Where the problem is encountered defines whether it's part of the function that you need to be debugging or part of how you called it. So pay attention to that as you work on these. We, of course, have some additional glossary steps. Make sure you understand all of this, all of these keywords or all of these glossary terms. You will be working for this chapter, these exercises here at the end. 
I would encourage you to try to work through them on your own and then use the links to further your understanding to make sure you understand how to make it work correctly.